So have you ever had a lucid dream? Do you know the difference between astral projection and dreaming? I thought this was a tremendous topic and so I'm very happy to be talking with Sarah Jane. She's an independent researcher with a particular interest in sleep and dream culture in the ancient world. And she's very knowledgeable about the entire topic of dreaming and is strongly interested in using dreaming in interesting and varied ways. I'd like to welcome Sarah Janes. What got you interested in, shall we say, the esoteric dreaming, lucid dreaming in the first place? It was dreaming. Dreaming was the thing that inspired me the most. And I've always had really interesting and exciting, inspiring, creative dreams since I was a kid. So I also had a lot of lucid dreams and I kind of didn't realise, I guess, initially that everyone doesn't necessarily have lucid dreams or think that much about their dream life. But it was always it was the kind of thread of my life was really all about dreams. So I was always drawn towards books that were about dreams or films that are about dreams. And then I guess it created something of a kind of feedback system. And then um, my research into um, the culture of dreaming, the sort of ancient history of dreaming, the anthropology of dreaming came from, I started um, my own little lecture club in St. Leonard's and one of the speakers was Dr. David Luke, who's a psychologist who studies, I think, what's called exceptional human experiences at the University of Greenwich. And he told me about the tradition of sleep temples in ancient Greece. And yeah. that I just found really inspiring. And I didn't go to university. I went to drama school. But I've always read a lot and I've always been interested in educating myself. And um, after I had my daughter, I thought I might go to university because it was something to do. <laughs> and uh, I thought that would be quite a good use of my time. So I started to bunk into lectures at the University of Sussex, pretend to be a student there. And then I realised that actually I could pick and choose what I wanted to learn about by asking the lecturers to come and talk at my club. So I started a little club, <laughs> a little town that I work in. I gave the lecturers £100 and I charged everyone that came a fiver and made them dinner as well so actually I wasn't making any profit or anything but um, uh, it was really good and I, I started off with neuroscience more or less and then it really morphed into more of my kind of I suppose more of my uh, core interests which are things like the history of religion and spirituality and uh, anthropology and dreaming and the esoteric and these sorts of things. Yeah, sounds it. I mean, uh, dreaming is something that I think, uh, if you recall, when I was talking to you and um, and Mr. Peak, I was talking a, a little bit about wakeful dreaming in the sense that I have these sort of visions when I'm awake. But I also do dream like crazy. And I just recently, having <clears throat> read your website and stuff, I, I got myself a little book. I'm not very good, though. I, I, I wake up in the morning and by the time I've made my coffee and been to the bathroom and remembered to write it down. It's already forgotten. I, I assume you have the discipline or you have a good memory of what you dream about, do you? I think you, well, lucid dreaming, lucid dreams tend to be as rememberable as waking reality because there are certain regions of your brain that are active. That means that the same sort of memory functionality that you would have if you were awake is, is working. So Often you find if you have lucid dreams that you do remember them and you don't even need to write them down, but obviously it helps for little details and things. But yeah, I, I still write dreams down pretty much immediately after dreaming them because you can remember something so crystal clear. And then if you don't write it down, like you say, just getting out of bed, you will have forgotten it. And it seems amazing that you will have forgotten about it. And that's one of the most that's one of the things that I find most incredibly fascinating about dreaming is the actual memory systems that are involved in dream memory, because it seems yeah. like something very different to waking consciousness. And I wonder if there is this uh, subconscious memory system that we don't really understand very well that might, um, might kind of be part of the evolution of our consciousness. And perhaps ancient people did remember dreams as vividly as they remember wakefulness yeah you're giving me all kinds of ideas um because <laughs> i i dream like so intensely mm. that i often even blog 
blog about the idea. Am, am I, is this, is this a dream or was what I was dreaming last night my real life? Because what I do remember of my dreams is they're very vivid, very intense, very busy. And so I tend to wake up kind of thinking, good Lord, you know, I did more last night than I did during the day the day before. Yeah, um, interesting that a lot of people say that, that they, I mean, there are a number of circadian rhythm disorders whereby if you wake up feeling tired, you really shouldn't wake up feeling tired. And I know a lot of people have extremely vivid dreams where they literally wake up feeling exhausted from the stuff that they've been doing in their dreaming. But I can do a lot in my dreams, but I generally feel very non-physical in the dream world. So I don't feel like I'm ever exerting myself unless something scary happens and your heart rate starts to go up. Um, right. I don't t tend to feel like I'm I'm wearing myself out during dreams, but I find it really interesting. Well, I want to ask you a couple of questions about my dreams, just for fun, because um, I saw that you do a bit of dream interpretation as well, and then uh, go back to the to the, the main topic. But um, the other day, for the first time that I can remember, I was having a dream, mm -hmm. and I was very busy. And the, the, it always involves um, my phone. I can't remember how to use my phone properly, and I have to call somebody or I'm on the wrong bus or the wrong train and I have to get off and get on the right one. It's always like that kind of busy, busy type of dream. And I found myself in this room, a very familiar room in a big house and it's like a real big vaulted ceiling. And I just saw a shadow flit across the sort of roof. And that was enough to, to make me frightened. Yeah. And I opened the door into what I thought would be a corridor and, and it was pitch black. And I knew something was in there with me. So I start screaming help 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 because I couldn't find my way out and somebody put their hand on my shoulder and I realized it was my daughter she'd come in and and she was shaking me dad dad wake up wake up and I rolled around and she was knelt on my bed and she says dad dad you're screaming you're screaming what's wrong are you all right I says don't worry I'm, I'm just dreaming and then I woke up in my bed alone <laughs> Yeah, those dreaming within a dream is that is that usual oh that was really that's, bizarre that's kind of that's more of what i would call a false awakening i used to get tons of those when i was a kid when i used to have to get um, up for school and i obviously didn't want to so i used to dream i was getting dressed for ages and ages and then i would wake up and hadn't started getting dressed at all they're almost to me they're almost a little bit like um you know people talk about astral projection it's yeah. kind of Part of your consciousness wants to get out of the situation, so they create a dream scenario that facilitates that. Sometimes I think that that's what happens with those kinds of situations. That's certainly what was happening when I used to dream about getting dressed because I didn't want to have to put the physical effort into getting dressed, so I would, my dream body would do it. Yeah, I mean, I, in all my life, I can't remember ever having dreamed of waking up and then real, waking up again, realizing that I was dreaming within a dream. I, I thought that that had me going for a couple of days. I'm like, wow, you can weird have, experience. <laughs> I don't, I can't bear that film um, Inception, but yeah. they do some kind of stuff of dream dreams within dreams. And I've had dreams myself, lucid dreams, where I have to go through five layers of five different dreams to get out eventually. And wow. Um, yeah, that, that doesn't happen too often with me, but that's, you know, dreams within dreams can be can be pretty common. I was going to say, actually, one of the, the couple of points that you brought up about your dreams really interesting, because I think this thing of trains and train stations and methods of transport are really interesting, because actually I think there's something about the dream state where you do have to keep in constant motion. It's almost like your body has to keep moving forward through dream space in order to keep the dream going. And I think that that's what happens sometimes when people become lucid, they stop in the dream space and that can sometimes make them wake up. And uh, train stations, pretty much every single night, um, I will have a dream that's got a train station in it. And I think that there are certain things, if you do write your dreams down, one of the best things and the best reason to write your dreams down is to establish and identify what your personal mythology is, what your um, motifs and themes are in dreams, because I think we all have them, especially, you know, yeah. uh, if we've lived a little while and we've like 
we've got these themes and these interests in life, they do tend to pop up in dreams. So I always think of a, a dreamer as like a film director and their dreams are their oeuvre and you have to look over your oeuvre and work out what your themes and motifs are. And this helps you become lucid as well because the more familiar you become with your motifs, because sometimes we dream about the same things all the time, but we never make a conscious decision to recognize that. So I did a workshop last week uh, where we talked about dreaming and the kinds of forms and structures and architecture that you see in dreams. I call it psychic architecture because it is like you form your personality in these these dream structures and you can look at it a bit like the mnemonic device the uh, of the memory palette so if you walk through a dream and you are remembering the things within that dream you can kind of give them you can give information to them you can like remember the fact that you're dreaming by observing these things and train stations i think if you wake up every morning and just say did i dream about a train station or train station they'll be it will help you re remember parts of the dream and for right. example I also have lots of dreams that feature water in like ponds rivers streams springs wells and so if I think about that then that can often help bring back sections of the dream I think there's this idea sometimes of dream journaling that dreams are linear and I actually think they aren't linear which is part of the reason why they can be difficult to remember or they evaporate upon waking waking because you're trying to trace a line and that it isn't really a line. It's more like a tapestry of everything happening. Yeah, I think I can relate to that. I think sometimes when I when I wake up and I do remember a bit of a dream, I'm thinking, my God, it, that the dream sort of it's as if I'm in the center and everything's shifting around me and, and the slightest thought creates a new scenario. So one situation morphs into the next, into the next, into the next. And sometimes there's no real link. There doesn't seem to be any linkage between them. Yeah. And right. there's multiple things going on at the same time. Weird stuff. I think words are really powerful with, with regards to dreaming as well. And that's one of the reasons why dream journaling is so effective is because you create this kind of magical feedback loop between what you're writing down and your dreams because your dreams do manifest words into thought forms. And I, you know, if you've ever had the experience of that, a conscious hypnagogia when you're drifting off to sleep and you just start to see images and you allow yeah. your mind to relax and you see fantastic things and uh but because you're not giving any of them too much attention they kind of just drift past you and you do start to notice because you can go through hypnagogia maintaining this kind of thread of awareness and end up in a fully lucid dream state and what you do recognize when you do that is that any thought that you have, any like passing fancy thought, sound is manifested. You know, it's even a sound in the yeah. background of the room you're sleeping in will be manifested into a kind of thought form. And they eventually make up the entire environment that you're in when you're in the dream proper. So the other, the other topic uh, that I wanted just to, to tell you about my dreams is that when I was a kid, I used to dream every night and pick up where I left off. So the, the the dream was that it was like a corn. It was like the Cornish coast. I always used to feel like it was Cornwall, mm -hmm. very steep cliffs, uh, very stormy weather, and there was a small island, but it was only maybe ten meters offshore, a, a small island with a house on. And for ages, I was trying to reach this house, and eventually, I managed to reach the house. And then I would look through the windows, and I would see this little girl about my age. And eventually I managed to attract her attention and then we started to put, she let me in. She was very afraid of her wicked aunt who looked after her and never wanted us to be discovered. This went on for months and months and months. And I could literally wake up one day and then go back to bed the next night and continue continue the same dream. Eventually um, we got together and, and we, we managed to overthrow the wicked auntie and then the dream stopped. But it went on for months and months That's and excellent. Uh, was really very intense. And, and I, I really looked forward to going to bed because I was in love with this little girl and I've never been able to find her. And I spent my entire life trying to find this little girl that, that I was you know, in love with as a maybe a six or seven or eight year old kid. <laughs> which sounds daft I know but it's the truth no, this really makes me this is a p absolutely like perfect archetypal dream to illustrate the anima and the mansion of the soul to me that little girl sounds like your anima yeah. and the reason why the dream stopped is because you had integrated your anima 
and the mansion of the soul is this really kind of potent structure in the dream space that represents your psyche you know is the memory palace of your personality really and it's interesting that it was this little house on a little island because you were young as well so it hadn't fully developed and then it was interesting that you were talking after that about this this big house that you were in as you were a bit older and yeah and, and the big house has elements i, I recognize the room and it's the same room from the little house but interesting so yeah you do that yeah. you consolidate those yeah. spaces and you know if you can become conscious in your dreams you can recognize where you get this um almost a composition of this space that's created out of places that you've experienced, places that you've dreamed. I mean, on the point of dream memory, one of the things that I find really interesting is when I'm within a dream, and I've spoken to lots of other people about this as well, with regard to the, what's happening when you remember things um, in the dream state and when you then wake up, is sometimes I can remember in the dream state, or very often in the dream state, I feel like I remember all the lives and all the worlds of the dream space. So I feel like I'm accessing this almost like a Kashic field level of right. information in the dream space that you aren't privy to when you wake up, but you get this sense that it's out there and that it exists. One of the things with your dream as well about the little girl on the island, it sounds very fairy tale like. And um, one of the things I'm fascinated in is the impact of narrative and story on dreaming and on memory and um even on a neurological level, when we read a book, when we get really engrossed in a story, our brain creates these new neural pathways so that it's some part of us, our creative imagination is actively living that experience. I think that can be really powerful. One of my top tips for dreaming is for people to read really good books before they go to bed. I'm at the moment, I'm working with a an American um, lady who is a, a, a grandmother. She's um, in, in the shamanic tradition, the, the, Sl the Slavic shamanic tradition, because I'm living in the Czech Republic and I'm getting very interested in the Slavic pantheon of gods and, and mythology, etc. And of course, she, like many shamans, talks about being a dreamer and the importance of dreams and remembering dreams. So this this idea that dreaming, this sort of automatic thing that, that everybody does every night can be combined with this deliberate medit meditative state type experience mm. that that to me is fascinating and I, I've never really until recently had much of an interest necessarily in the dreaming side but how do those two things relate so for example I can meditate and I can have a dreamlike experience like a lucid dream in which I'm fully in control, but I'm in a completely different space, a different world, and have an experience that's very, very um, religious or esoteric or whatever. And she wants us to combine that with our nightly dream life. How, how do the two things link together in your mind? One of the things I've noticed is the more I meditate, the less active my dreams are. And I think that's because dreams are there often to help you process situations that are going on or are causing confusion and um, I remember when I did a 10-day meditation retreat the first couple of days of it was the most intense crazy dreaming and then after settling into like a routine of eight hours a day meditating my dreams just became really um, almost empty like I was dreaming and aware, aware of dreaming but I was the same as I was in my waking reality. Like I could meditate in the dream space and um, sometimes I'd just be in a black space or in the sky with stars. There wasn't the kind of drama or the emotional stuff that there was going on previously. So I, I yeah. did an element of that. And I actually remember a woman saying to me at the end of this meditation that old oh, dreams are all just Maya, they're all just illusion. It's all part of the same thing. And uh, you know, they're not important. And I remember thinking part of me was like, oh, she's sort of right. It sort of is, it kind of is that, but the creativity of it gives me so much pleasure and joy that I realized I obviously still wanted to do it. Because it's an incredibly pleasurable and creative experience. I was just going to say, I think, you know, my, my interest in dreaming as a child was so intense. I was so obsessed with my dream life. I found it so 
just incredibly exciting and brilliant. And I think even then, I, I don't know if I thought I was traveling to different places, but it gave me a sense of there being this other other world. And like you, I used to go to a, the same place every single night and I could draw maps of it. It was like a kind of Tolkien or Alice in Wonderland type place where I'd often be in different parts of it, but I would know that it was the same land and where the bit I was in related to all the other places. And I just loved it so much. And I really, you know, I wanted to be a film director because I just wanted to make a film that somehow expressed what it looked like in my dream world. And my other thinking about it was that if I could perfect lucid dreaming, and this kind of, this is something that's obviously a big part of dream yoga, if I could perfect lucid dreaming and just lucid dream whenever I wanted to, then I would be able to survive death and be conscious into my next life. I mean, when I was a kid, I do remember talking about having these two past lives and I don't really remember much about them anymore. But in one, I was, uh, <laughs> I don't know where they came from. I wouldn't be certain that they didn't come from some advert in the 80s that I saw or whatever. But in my head, I remember some I, some notion of me doing the parallel bars in Canada or America. <laughs> wow. I think that the way that shamans use think about dreaming is is as an extension of waking waking life and that everything is a dream yeah right. waking life is as much of a dream as dreaming it's just uh, two two sides of the same coin right. and therefore there's something to be learned in terms of the symbols that, the, that that you present to yourself or are presented to you depending on which way you look at it and uh, being guided and following that stream and this is very much what I call magic is following that stream of synchronicity that, you know. Yeah, my, my thing with dreaming is definitely, I think it's important to establish this continuity between, I talk to a lot of people and I find it quite interesting because their dream lives are, they're often quite punishing and knowing them in real life, I, I can, I would I would say that there are some things in their lives that they're in denial about or they're deluded about, and these things rise to the surface in dreams. So I think it's important to have that continuity there. And one of the things that I've noticed in my own dream life is the way you represent yourself in dreams is interesting as well. You can represent yourself in dreams as your best possible version of yourself. And often that relationship between who you really are and your sort of dream avatar, if you like, is quite an interesting one. Yeah, can you imagine? I don't know how I represent myself in dreams. I, I'm not looking at me. I'm, I'm very outward focused. Mm. I can't think of ever dreaming of looking at myself. I'm always living, looking outward. And another thing I dream, or I used to dream quite a lot, is that every, watching airplanes take off and knowing they're going to crash over and over and over again. I used to hate that dream. Yeah, that's that's a not ideal dream, especially if you do have to fly ever. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you just, it takes off, I'm watching it, and I'm just, I'm ready. I know it's going to crash, and it does, it just suddenly goes into the ground, and there'll be two or three of them take off one after the other and crash the same way. I don't know what that means, but, uh, no, I don't enjoy that one. No, it doesn't sound great. I mean, I remember having a dream when I was flying. I, it was just before I was flying back from Barcelona, and I had a dream of two giant eagles flying, carrying a chick in their claws and then dropping it into a stream. And, um, and then it was like clawing the air, trying to get out of this stream, having been dropped from a great height. The next day I saw a friend of mine in Hastings who was Spanish post a picture of her child holding these chicken feet that she'd bought in a Chinese supermarket. And I remember thinking, God, that's really weird. They're like the chicken. They're like the um, chick's claws that I saw in my dream. Right. And um, also she was Spanish and her name was uh, Rosa Diaz. And uh, my dream had that in it. And I was staying in a place called um, that had El Magia Rosa. And, um, and I kind of thought a dream really, you know, I'm very interested in how dreams can have this oracular function and uh, provide divination. And I think like... Um, you know, I was talking to someone that studies neuroscience recently and they were talking about this predictive model of the brain and that the brain is always trying to make sense out of essentially the sort of interference pattern of reality, I guess. And I think that's how the dream oracles would have worked is that 
almost in any phenomena you can you can construct an oracle that would accurately predict the future because everything is within everything else and uh, when I had this dream I remember like flying that day and um, looking out of the window and seeing another plane come towards me and there was a stream underneath us and I was thinking oh that dream might have meant that the plane was going to crash because there's two planes next to each other and there's a stream right below us but then the dream also you know it could have mean, meant anything so yeah. uh, I, I find the the idea of divination and oracles which was the you know the earliest the earliest information we have about dream culture in terms of people looking to their dreams for any purpose was to tell the future and yeah. to construct oracles out of them which I find really really fascinating I think that definitely ancient people had a different relationship to their dream life than we might these days I think ancient people had a different relationship to everything yeah <laughs> as I as I work with um, you know the god forms in the Slavic hierarchy the one thing that always, that comes across very strongly is that that the Slavs had a very different idea of, of transition to death yeah. And I, it just keeps coming through to me that the, the, the veil to them was very thin and they weren't as worried about dying. Yeah. To them, it was just uh, like going to sleep and waking up somewhere else. That's the impression I get sort of working with, with these god forms. And also I get the impression that their gods were, were basically natural forces personified. Uh, very much so. Yeah. The stuff that I look into, especially uh, in the ancient Near East, in ancient Greece and, and play, especially Manoa. Manoa, I think, was a solar worshipping society. And I think it's it's useful because these natural forces, like you say, they're sort of invisible. So you need a visible target in order to project your psychic attention to it. You know, if there's a statue or a form or a god form or a human being, you can, you've got something to focus your adoration upon. And it can yeah. be hard to focus your attention on something that's invisible yeah. and tangible so yeah I really agree with that I mean, I'm still intrigued as to what what the difference is between a nighttime dream and a, a, a meditational experience do you do you have any idea what is there is there a mechanical difference or there are mechanical differences within sleep but then even even within that there are deep states of meditation where a lot of uh, people that meditate for long periods of time really experienced practitioners so they don't need as much sleep so probably there's some things going on there which are so close to sleep that there's a, a strong overlap in the winter there I was trying to um, work with Marana which is the goddess of winter and I'd play some music and, and lit a candle and relax and start calling the name and visualizing the form and the next thing I know, she's right there in front of me, and um, <laughs> I'm in this place, you know, um, ice, like a, an ice, ice stove or lake, snow peak mountains, this beautiful snow queen like creature in front of me. And it's Marana, it's the goddess of, of winter and the goddess of death, you know, the Slavic goddess. And she spoke to me, and I came out of that thing like waking up. It was as if I'd been asleep, in a, having a dream, but I was not really I, I, my mind my body was asleep but my mind was awake i suppose yeah, yeah. yeah. It does sound like a, a lucid dream yeah incredible experience and i don't have them very often and they don't seem to come according to plan you know i can meditate every day and i can try and try and try and nothing nothing i get just vague impressions and then some other time i'll just close my eyes and just start and bang i'm gone i'm somewhere else completely it's bizarre how it works. I haven't figured it out at all yet. That's why I was interested if, if you see a link between the meditational experience and the dreaming experience, just to see if there's anything to understand there. I think that, you know, one of the things I'm always saying is I think imagination, like the yeah. actual real creative imagination is just woefully underrated. It's such a powerful force and it's so easy to tap into as well sometimes. You know, sensory deprivation isn't really like, the trendiest way to have visionary experiences it's you know it seems a bit too hard but if you go into something like a sensory deprivation tank you quite quickly start to very vividly see visuals you know I think the human brain and the human mind is is primed 
hopefully, like you say, that those in, those experiences are just the other side of the coin. And I think we used to be a lot more familiar with them. Well, certainly talking to this lady in the US and also um, a, a friend of mine that has practiced in a, in a different shamanic um, way, dreaming is, is a tool and they believe that we're dreaming all the time. It's just nighttime dreaming is a different version of daytime dreaming and it's all accessing either the inner workings of yourself or, or you know the microcosm macrocosm uh, concept the the whole entity so it's a it's a very interesting topic and and you were saying that it got you interested and took you off in a direction and I, and I think perhaps in the same sense I started reading Lord of the Rings and all kinds of weird books about kids that looked in and were sick and looked into a picture on the wall and went into the picture and had a an experience and I got into magic that way yeah um, so probably we, we kind of went in a similar direction but off you know different directions but in the same way I suspect so what what sort of activities do you get up to in order to pursue the interest in dreams I saw you do some weekend retreats for example or did do when one could do such things at the moment, I'm just doing online workshops. I also sell, oh, how did you enjoy my dream tea? I, I melt, make dream tea and I sell it on the Etsy. I've got a um, uh, a dream tea recipe. I like it. Uh, I've used it two or three times. I can't say I remember any dreams after taking it, but I certainly slept like a log. Very relaxing. <laughs> it gives me really romantic dreams because it has two aphrodisiacs in it, which I think. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> I, it was funny because when I um, first took it, when I first had my first cupful, I really like it. And um, I guess the aphrodisiac effect is just that it makes you feel like really lovely and relaxed and comfortable. And I think if you go to sleep feeling lovely and relaxed and comfortable, then you're likely to have lovely, relaxed, comfortable dreams. But it was funny because I was telling uh, a friend of mine that it, get, it keeps giving me these really romantic dreams and she was like, I want it. So she bought it <laughs> and she had these really, <laughs> really intense romantic dreams and she told her housemate and her housemate was like, I want it. So um, everyone got hold of it, it was quite funny. By romantic, you mean? <laughs> No, not really like not like erotic or wet dreams. Okay. I suppose they are quite erotic, but they're less like they're less like a sort of sex dreamy thing and more like a deep love feeling dream. They're really good. Yeah, see, I'm probably avoiding those sort of things because <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm single and um, well, I, I mean, I'm I'm looking, I suppose, but I'm, you, you know, that, uh, that girl's grown up in the uh, house in the castle. Yeah. I have the same interpretation of that dream that you did, which is that that, that was that's my anima. And so, yeah, but I, I think that having had that dream, it certainly had a, bit, a much larger influence. If I look back, it's had a hell of an influence on my life because I'm, I'm always looking for that for that girl. Never gotten past that and I don't know how to. So, Can you remember know. what she looks like now? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, uh, well, so... What sort of things do you get up to on a weekend dreaming retreat? Well, I do a lot of sleep hypnosis. That's my favorite way of doing uh -huh. it. I, I, I have a lot of people that come to my workshops that basically have never had lucid dreams. And I just feel bad for telling them about how good they are. So instead of that, I thought I would um, do sleep hypnosis. And then they have a pleasurable experience and they get the gist of what it feels like to have a lucid dream that way. So, yeah, I do sleep hypnosis sessions I also do like one-on-one -on -one consultations for people I've got some sleep hypnosis sessions on YouTube as well and uh, I mostly do I try to do it in a ritual way because I'm really inspired by the tradition of ancient Greece of the Asclepians the sleep temples that were dedicated mm -hmm. to dream healer god Asclepius so I try to create that sort of a ritual setting my fantasy is that I will establish a sleep temple somewhere in Minoan Greece um, eventually. Oh, and, boy. Yeah. If you do that, if you do that, and I'm still around, I'm coming because I love Greece as well. And uh, definitely feel a strong affinity for Greece. I, I hadn't realized it until recently because I was living in the U.S. for so long, you know, I've never been there. And when I finally went, I was just, I mean, talk about walking through a landscape and thinking, well, my God, I've been here before. Yeah, I felt that way on Santorini. Everyone talks about how touristy it is, but I think it's got a magical power, Santorini, and I just love it. There's something really feng shui about being high up and being able to see the sea from high up. 
and um, I just really loved it. And I love Minoan culture and Minoan art and the Minoan aesthetic, I just think is absolutely beautiful. So, and I love the food. There's something amazing about Greek restaurants that you just don't really get. I've never really experienced anywhere else. It's this intense pleasure in making people comfortable. I've told people, you know, I'd love to move to Greece. And they look at me like, well, my ex, she looks at me like I'm a lunatic. You know, well, I think you can't even read the language, you know, which is true. But I don't care. I mean, I love it. That's beautiful. I think the languages, there's something really beautiful about the language where I get a lot of pleasure from just looking and, and trying to work out what things say. And there's something really intuitive about it as well. And there's something, I guess, that ancient, that ancient continuity is there in the language. And... Um, yeah, I just think it's a beautiful, perfect place and great place for a sleep temple. So lucid dreaming, do you think I've lucid dream, dreamed? Or, I mean, because I can't say that I feel necessarily like I'm aware that I'm dreaming, mm. but I do feel sometimes as if I'm dictating the content of my dream. Yeah, I don't know. I think lucidity may be not necessarily like the best idea of the phenomena exactly you know i mean it is a bona fide state of consciousness it is different to dreaming and it is different to being awake like neuroscientists can see that your frontal cortex is activated so you're able to self-reflect and apply critical thinking to situations while you're in the dream and the right. way i describe lucid dreaming myself is that it's when you're in a dream and you can remember who and where you are. It doesn't sound like much, but there's something even in that, that I often get this associated sensation of like absolute bliss. Like it's a blissful experience to just know yeah. that you're present in a dream. It feels amazing. And I guess yeah. that's one of the main reasons why I was so into it as a kid, because it just felt, it felt, it actually just physically felt amazing to be in a lucid dream. Um, yeah, I think I could do it when I was a kid. I think I, I can't do it. If you talk to me about lucid dreaming, my understanding is I know I'm in a dream and I'm dictating it like a movie. I can't do that. I could as a kid. I can't now. But I do I do think I do somehow dictate. I know I'm dreaming sometimes, yeah. right? Bizarre. I mean, that's, that's, there's so many kind of different expressions of it. The, the thing that I most strongly align it to is the feeling of bliss, is the feeling, the bodily right. sensation. That to me, it's almost like sometimes I say to people, it's actually a bit like an orgasm. Right. You could say, I don't know if I've had an orgasm, but then when you have had one, you'll be like, oh, I definitely know that that was one. And right. the same goes for lucid dreaming for, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and, and how does it compare with astral projection? Because I... I mean, I remember as a student, the first time I managed to astrally project, it seemed to me as if I'd had a dream. I, w I definitely seemed to wake up. So I had this experience that I was bumping along the roof, this roof, and I, I was like, where the hell am I? And then I realized I was in the students' union, yeah. and it was the, 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 the roof in the theater going down like in a zigzag pattern, you know? And I, I was thinking to myself, well, hang on, why the disco lights? Why is the music? Why is this full? I, I was the stage manager for Aston University Students Union. So I was kind of puzzled. Why, why are the people here? Surely I should know about this. And I saw my friend. So I w walked through the wall and stood next to him. And I'm tr saying, Steve, what, what's going on? And he just ignored me. And I was getting really upset, you know, very pissed. Why the hell is he ignoring me? Mm. And all of a sudden he, he went off and I'm following him. And then the next thing I, I hear this getting louder and louder and I woke up and someone's knocking at my door. I opened the door, there's my friend Steve. I said, it's okay, I know. There's some function going on and you need me. And he said, how the hell did you know that? Wow, that's really interesting. Well, you know, astral projection, it still is a bit of a debated topic, whether it's dreaming or your astral body leaving your physical body. Yeah. And actually it does bring to mind the false awakenings to me because they are so real and it is like a part of you comes out of your body and yeah. goes traveling. And really for me, the sort of difference with, between astral projection and, and lucid dreaming is that you're occupying a real space in, in um, the astral projection. You know, your body, you know, you are traveling out of your body and uh, a lucid dream feels like you go inside. And I do believe that some lucid dreams i mean there are lots of the more familiar you become with your dream experiences 
the easier it is to work out where certain ideas and certain events come from, where the thoughts of them come from. And uh, one of the really interesting people I interviewed with Anthony Peake actually was um, Rebecca Sharrock, who has highly superior autobiographical memory. And oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, absolutely fascinating to me because the first thing I wanted to ask her about was your dreams must, you must just remember all your dreams. And she does. She's always lucid in her dreams. And wow. it's, it's interesting because, I mean, that was like a real a real eureka moment for me about this memory business because of the way Rebecca thinks she's a synesthetic as well and she's autistic and there's something amazing about her brain where it is all integrated essentially she says that she compartmentalizes information she color codes it everything's sort of cross-referenced in her brain in a way that neurotypical brains aren't this is the one that um you re read a piece of Harry Potter at random and she finished it. Yeah. Word for word. Unbelievable. You talked about imagination. I think imagination is the key to everything. I'm, you know, as a magician, it's certainly the key to magic. Where does imagination reality start and finish? And that if, you know, if you start talking to Anthony Peake, you start to wonder if everything isn't just imagination at the end of the day, you know? Where, where, where do you go with that? <laughs> I guess I believe in... I very much believe in creative power and that's what I think Hecker or magic is, is that you put attention and ideas into the world and then that's how the world reflects back to you. And I love the idea, you know, in ancient Egypt, they believed that the hieroglyphs, the Medu Neja, were the words of God or divine words. And when you carved them into a surface or you wrote them down, you summoned up the power of those words and you created um you know like uh, anthony does talk about the ideas of egregores and tulpas you kind of create these yeah. thought forms and they end up becoming real the more you think about them because you know yeah. even I think about stuff like um star trek <laughs> i'm a massive science fiction fan and i think that when culture or artists create books movies stories eventually they filter through the popular imagination and become reality because people are then primed to create those things that they've read about or seen paintings of or that they've imagined and that reality really is a um a feedback system between thought and matter it's interesting because when you watch um, the, the original series of Star Trek, I love how they're all walking around with their Apple, um, you know, iPads. Yeah, yeah. And, and certainly you see the iPad idea uh, in the 1960s, though, which I, I always thought was pretty intriguing. If people want to find out more about you and you, you work with Dreaming, where can they go? They can go to www.themysteries.org. That's my website, and that has everything that I do on. Cool. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So my thanks to Sarah Janes for joining me for this edition on the fascinating topic of dreaming. And if you'd like to learn more about her and uh, maybe participate in one of her workshops or buy some of that amazing dream tea, you'll find details on how to contact her below in the notes accompanying this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please do like and follow and share as broadly as you can. I'd very much appreciate that. Once again, thanks for joining me, G. Michael Vasey, on the magical world of G. Michael Vasey with Sarah James. Thanks to her. Goodbye. Goodbye.